Thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about the sagittal plane today. So the other day we did a video on the transverse plane. We're going to do a video on the frontal plane. And ultimately we'll cover all three planes in these videos. And this is something that I've been wanting to do for a while because if you're a subscriber to the blog or you read the blog, you've probably noticed that at least once every pose I mention the plane or the planes of motion. So I'm hoping that this will help you to see those motions or imagine those motions based on your new understanding of the plane because that's really important to be able to see what motions are actually occurring at the joint. Okay. The other reason why I wanted to do these videos is because I wanted my students to have something that they could go back to to reinforce the information that we cover in class because you just have to keep seeing this information until it becomes second nature so you can just look at the joint, look at the motion and be able to see the axis and see the plane without even really having to think about it. Okay, so one thing to think about is the axis is always perpendicular to the plane. So if you think about what we talked about in the last video, you can see now that I'm going to use the clock again, and the clock here is lying in what would, be, what would be called the frontal plane. So then I can take the axis, and I can line it up with the axis of the clock, and you can see that the axis is perpendicular to the plane. Okay, But since we're talking about the sagittal plane, I'm going to take the clock now, and I'm going to turn it so that it is going in this direction and so now it's representing the sagittal plane and by definition the sagittal plane cuts the body into right and left halves and so I can take this axis and I can place it on the clock so that it is running from medial to lateral and of course we would describe it that way so we would say that this is a medial lateral axis and it is perpendicular to the sagittal plane. Another way to describe this axis is you might describe it as fronto-horizontal. And what that means is that the axis is lying in the frontal plane and it's horizontal to the floor. So we would call it a fronto-horizontal axis or a medial lateral axis. But either way, you can see that the axis is perpendicular to the plane. Okay, so then we take the plane and we place it on the skeleton and you can see that the plane is cutting the body into right and left halves. Okay, so then we can take the plane, <clears throat> place it down at the level of the shoulder and then take the axis, place it at the glenohumeral joint or shoulder joint and you can see that the axis is perpendicular to the plane. Okay the axis is perpendicular to the plane. So the first thing you want to think about when you think about joint motion is does that joint allow for that plane of motion? Okay, and of course you, you, can, you know that in this example this is a ball and socket joint. So it's going to allow for triplane motion or triplanar motion because it is a triaxial joint. So if you look at the joint itself you can see the head of the humerus here is convex, it's like a golf ball, and then it's meeting that concave surface um, on the scapula that we call the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity, and that's very shallow, so it's like a golf ball sitting on a golf tee, okay? But it's still a ball and socket joint, it's just a very unstable joint. So if I place the axis here at the glenohumeral joint, you can see that it's going to allow for this motion where you're seeing the humerus coming closer to you. So we would call that flexion of the arm at the shoulder joint. And then, of course, the opposite of that is extension of the arm at the shoulder joint. So I'll do it one more time. Flexion of the arm at the shoulder joint and extension of the arm at the shoulder joint. So if I'm in anatomical position here, I can place the axis in the same position. It's running from medial to lateral, and I can do flexion of the arm at the shoulder joint, and then, of course, extension of the arm at the shoulder joint. 
So I'm in an anatomical position, and then of course I can go from anatomical position to extension of the arm at the shoulder joint. Or I can go from this position back to anatomical position, and of course we would call that flexion of the arm at the shoulder joint. Okay, so extension of the arm at the shoulder joint and flexion of the arm at the shoulder joint. Okay, if we go to the elbow joint, you probably know at this point that the elbow joint, based on its structure alone, is a pure hinge joint. So that means it's a uniaxial joint. So it's only allowing for that one plane of motion, which of course is sagittal plane motion. So it's a pure hinge joint and it's only allowing for sagittal plane motion. So I can place the axis here and we know that that humeral ulnar joint or the elbow joint is made up of the ulna, okay? So the ulna is medial to the radius or closer to midline. And then of course you have the humerus and those two bones form what is called the humeral ulnar joint and that allows for flexion and extension of the form at the elbow joint. So if you look at it, you can see that the radius and the ulna, the two bones that make up the form, are coming closer to the humerus. So we call that flexion of the form at the elbow joint. And then of course the opposite of that would be extension of the form at the elbow joint, okay? Now if we take that same axis and we place it down at the wrist joint, now what we're going to see is flexion of the hand at the wrist joint, okay, and then extension of the hand at the wrist joint. So it would be flexion of the hand at the wrist joint and extension of the hand at the wrist joint. And of course most of those, or both of those motions are occurring around this medial lateral axis, okay. Now if you think back to flexion, a great definition of flexion is where a body part or body parts are coming closer to a body part or body parts. So what I mean by that is if you look at the hand in this example, you have 26 bones that make up the hand and those 26 bones are coming closer to the two bones that make up the form, which of course is the ulna and the radius. So that is flexion, okay? So I'll say that one more time. Those 26 bones, okay, are come of the hand are coming closer to the ulna and the radius, the two bones that make up the form. And then if we look above here, you can see that the ulna and the radius, the two bones that make up the form, are coming closer to the humerus or the arm. Okay, so same example. You can see that both bones, the humerus, I'm sorry, the ulna and the radius, the two bones that make up the form, are coming closer to the humerus. So again, we would call that flexion. If we look at the hip, the same thing applies here. You can see that I have an axis that's running from medial to lateral, and I have flexion of the thigh at the hip joint, and of course, extension of the thigh at the hip joint. That's when the foot is off the ground. Now, imagine that you're doing a squat and the femur is fixed. Now you have the pelvis coming closer to you, so we call that an anterior tilt or flexion of the pelvis at the hip joint, okay? And that motion is occurring around a medial lateral axis, again, at the hip joint, okay? And then you can see the opposite here would be extension of the pelvis at the hip joint or a posterior tilt of the pelvis at the hip joint. So imagine you're doing a squat, okay, you have this axis at the hip joint and you can see that the pelvis is moving closer to you, so we would call that flexion of the pelvis or an anterior tilt and of course the trunk or the spine, the vertebral column, is following the pelvis. Okay, the opposite of that is extension or a posterior tilt of the pelvis at the hip joint, okay? So I'm gonna throw something else out of here. Imagine that you're <clears throat> thinking about 
uh, pulling your thigh into this position. So your foot's now off the ground and you're using your quadriceps to concentrically contract to pull you into this position. So we would say that it's flexion of the thigh at the hip joint and your quadriceps concentrically contracted to pull you into that position. Very simple. So those muscles are working against gravity to pull you into that position. But now imagine the same muscles, the quadriceps, you're doing a squat and now you have the pelvis and the femur moving together and so you might hear somebody refer to a squat as triple flexion and what they're referring to is the foot is fixed on the ground and the lower leg, the tibia and the fibula, okay, those two bones or body parts of the lower leg or that make up the lower leg are coming closer to the foot. So we would call that flexion or dorsiflexion of the lower leg at the ankle joint and then the thigh is flexing, okay? And at the same time that the thigh is flexing, you're ha you have the pelvis, again, moving towards you, so we would call it a flexion of the pelvis. But now, with your feet on the ground when you're doing the squat, your quadriceps are working in the opposite way, and they are eccentrically lengthening to control you. So now you're going with gravity, and those quadricep muscles are decelerating those motions. Can you see that? So in the first example, the quadriceps are concentrically contracting, your foot's coming off the ground, and you're flexing your thigh at the hip joint, okay? But that, for that same motion at that same joint, when you're doing a squat, now your quadriceps are eccentrically lengthening to control that motion as you decelerate or go with gravity, okay? Something to think about, but either way, if you think about it, your thigh is coming closer to the pelvis, so that's consistent with what we talked about with the definition of flexion. The thigh, the femur, is coming closer to the pelvis. Or, if the femur is fixed, you can see that the pelvis is coming closer to you, and it's coming closer to the femur. So, the pelvis, the body part, the pelvis, is coming closer to the bone or body part, the femur or thigh, okay? So if we look at the knee as an example now, you can see, and this I think you know already, but you can see that you have extension of the leg at the knee joint and of course flexion of the leg at the knee joint. Now this is a modified hinge joint, so it's a biaxial joint, but it does allow for sagittal plane motion, of course it allows for a lot of sagittal plane motion. So you can see that the lower leg is extending, okay, so we would say it's extension of the lower leg or the leg at the knee joint, and then of course flexion of the lower leg or the leg at the knee joint. So again, if you think about the lower leg in this example, you have the tibia, the bigger, the bo the bigger bone here, and the fibula, okay, of the lower leg, and you can see that the lower leg is coming closer to the femur. So again, that's consistent. Those two bones or body parts are moving closer to the femur, okay, a body part of the lower extremity. So those two bones are coming closer to the femur or thigh, and so we call that flexion. And the other example that I was giving you, you can see I can take this axis and put it at the ankle joint. Of course, it's not a pure medial lateral axis is kind of going on an oblique angle, but we'll say that it's uh, oriented more towards um, medial lateral, so it's a uh, medial lateral axis and of course it's perpendicular to the sagittal plane. So it would allow for dorsiflexion where you're seeing the 26 bones of the foot coming closer to the tibia and fibula, the two bones that make up the lower leg, and of course then we have the opposite of that which is plantar flexion where those 26 bones are moving farther from the lower leg. So those two bones that make up the lower leg, the tibia and the fibula, you can see that the 26 bones that make up the foot are moving closer to the lower leg. So we would call that dorsiflexion or flexion of the foot at the ankle joint. And then of course the opposite of that is plantar flexion 
or extension of the foot at the ankle joint. So again, bringing those 26 bones closer to the two bones that make up the lower leg is consistent with flexion. Another way to say that is still a medial lateral axis and going back to that example of the squat, you can see that if the foot is fixed, now you have the lower leg coming closer to the foot. So now you have the two bones, the tibia and the fibula, coming closer to the foot. So imagine you're doing a squat. So again, we're going to call this flexion because those two bones, the tibia and the fibula, are coming closer to the foot because the foot is fixed. Okay, And so we're going to call that flexion or dorsiflexion. But we would say flexion or dorsiflexion of the lower leg at the ankle joint. And of course the opposite of that would be plantar flexion or extension of the lower leg at the ankle joint. So dorsiflexion or flexion of the lower leg or leg at the ankle joint. Okay, you can see those two bones, the tibia and the fibula came closer to the foot, so the 26 bones of the foot, and then the opposite of that would be plantar flexion or extension where the tibia and the fibula are coming away from the foot or the 26 bones of the foot. Okay, so just something to think about, but I also want you to think about flexion being primarily in the sagittal plane. So flexion extension, okay, flexion extension, primarily occur in the sagittal plane. The only exception to that, the only exception to that, is the thumb. So when the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint is moving in what we call flexion extension, that motion, flexion extension of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint, is occurring in the frontal plane. Okay, we call it, we say that because the axis is oriented more towards being anterior, posterior, or running from anterior, posterior, so we call it an anterior, posterior axis, okay, and that axis is oriented more towards uh, being an anterior, posterior axis, so we would call it a frontal plane motion. So the axis is perpendicular to the plane, and so because you can see the axis, or because we're describing the axis that way, we're going to call flexion extension of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint a frontal plane motion. Okay, But overall, if you look at flexion extension throughout the entire chain, what you're seeing is a sagittal plane motion. So flexion extension primarily occurring in the sagittal plane around a medial lateral axis. Thanks a lot.